I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. This is one of those conversations that one looks forward to. I've been looking forward to this for some time. We originally conceived of this as how to think about reading in 2023 with so many pressures right and left of what to read, actually, and what is not permissible to read. But so much keeps changing, including around the world and Azar, including in your native country, Iran. I'm certain we're going to get to that too. I think these, this is one of those things where we have two of the, the smartest people we know, and let's just listen to them and then pepper them with questions the second half. I'm going to let uh, Tejas introduce our distinguished writers, an Iranian American and a Turkish American, by the way. Uh, Tejas is a research associate has been a research associate with American Purpose. He's a brilliant moderator, a young writer, podcaster studying now in Britain. He's going to manage the first part of the conversation, the second half of the program the 1 p.m. Eastern. I will call on people and you all get into the conversation. Thank you a million times. And Tejas, you have the floor. Lovely. Jess, thank you very much for that intro. Um, our two dis distinguished guests today are both professors of literature. First, Azar Nafizi is the author of the acclaimed memoir, Reading Lolita in Tehran, which has been reviewed and re-reviewed by countless people. And her latest book is called Read Dangerously. It came out, I believe, in March. And that was the book that I read that inspired me to kickstart this conversation. Our other guest is Dr. Merve Emre, who's Associate Professor of English at Oxford. And her book, that came out in 2017 titled Paraliterary, The Making of Bad Readers in Postwar America. And both of them have been very active in conversations about reading inside and outside the academy, reading in political situations. And this conversation, as Jeff mentioned, is fairly broad, but focuses on how do we go about reading amidst today's political climate? So I want to start with something that's re-entered the conversation fairly recently, and that was the fatwa that was put on novelist Salman Rushdie in 1989 because of his novel, The Satanic Verses. And he was stabbed brutally in August in upstate New York. And the assailant praised Ayatollah Khomeini. And so I want to start with you, Azar. And I know you've been quite involved with protesting in solidarity with the recent events that happened there after the death of Masa Amini. And I was wondering if you could just first speak about why Iran is so against thought. Why Iran is so against thought? First of all, um, it is great to be here and uh, to be in conversation with you and with Melvin. Um, second of all, um, yeah, uh, great question. I mean, uh, a totalitarian uh, mindset, uh, the first one of the first things they're against is thought. It is ideas and imagination. That is why, for example, in the Islamic Republic, but uh, uh, you can bring examples from other parts of the world, the first targets uh, of the regime uh, at the beginning of the revolution were women, um, minorities and those working in our cultural lives, especially writers and journalists, uh, because writers are after the truth and truth is so dangerous because once you know it, then you can not just keep silent, you have to become uh, a witness. And uh, many of the writers in my book uh, are uh, consider themselves as witnesses. Um, and you mentioned Rushdie. Uh, I chose Rushdie to begin my book with because of this question that keeps coming up, uh, that why is it that a person whose only weapon is his pen is so dangerous to the most powerful men in, uh, in the world that they want him dead? in order for them to survive. That shows the power of uh, uh, women, minorities, and uh, those in the culture, uh, involved in culture. Wonderful. Um, and then just from there, general question going out to both of you is, why is it that specifically fiction as a form of self-expression amongst others is so threatening as opposed to 
other types of art, news, any time, any type of nonfiction as well. I, I don't know that I would claim that fiction is more threatening than other kinds of speech. Uh, or I'm not sure what that claim would be based on. I think one thing that fiction might afford that would lead us to make a claim like that I, is that because fiction is often thought of as not being beholden to facticity in the same way that other genres seem to be beholden to it, there is more room to do things in fiction like imagine the world otherwise. And I think that what Azar was saying about the, the fear that people have once they realize that their power or their sense of power is beholden not just to material structures, but to the kinds of thoughts or the kinds of ideas that, uh, that people believe in, the capacity to imagine the world otherwise becomes a very powerful tool. And it can be a tool of oppression, but it can also be a tool of liberation. But I would just go back and maybe, maybe ask the ask the question that your question is premised on, which is, is fiction necessarily a, 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 a genre that people are more afraid of? Because I'm just thinking about how in Turkey, for instance, you see the jailing of journalists, you see the jailing of lawyers, you see the jailing of academics, you really see the jailing of people based on their speech indiscriminate of what genre they are writing in. Um, so. Maybe that maybe that gives us some some more questions that we can that we can ask and discuss. Well, uh, you're right. I mean, fiction is not the only subversive uh, uh, way of um, expression, and not not the only quote unquote dangerous uh, one. Um, there are two things about uh, fiction. Actually, you mentioned journalism. I think that journalism also becomes. Um, uh, dangerous because of the fact that it relies on facts. It relies on what happened. And uh, the first thing that the totalitarian mindsets rely on uh, is in fact lies. And you see this not just in a totalitarian society like Iran, uh, you see it in the United States today that the quote unquote big lie is the way that some uh, politicians in this country are right now um, recruiting uh, uh, people. And so that uh, Provence, that belong, uh, the lie belongs to the totalitarian mindset and the truth uh, belongs to whoever speaks it. Now, fiction is also subversive. I remember when, um, uh, the fatwa against Rushdie came, uh, Carlos Fuentes, the Mexican writer, uh, mentioned the fact that this is not just against Rushdie, it's against the democratic structure of the novel. Uh, because the novel, if you're writing a great book, uh, uh, you have to give voice to every character. Even the villain gets a voice. Novel is based not so much on judgment, but, I, but on understanding. And uh, that is where its subversiveness lies. But uh, I'm glad that maybe you mentioned uh, the fact that it is not the only form, but it is one of the most important uh, forms that uh, uh, destabilizes uh, uh, the totalitarian uh, mindsets, uh, whether in democracies or in uh, autocracies. In terms of the literature that's been coming out, it destabilizes and it tells truths that might not want to be heard. I guess coming from the opposite perspective as reading, both of you in your books treat reading as a very active form, whether it's reading literature, reading fiction, reading bureaucratic documents. It's not just a quote unquote cliche passive reading for the story. Can you both say more about what is the active process involved in reading? I would maybe qualify that a little bit, Tejas, and, and just say that I, in addition to thinking about reading as an active process, 
I imagine that what both Azar and I care deeply about is bringing a kind of historical uh, specificity to bear on the idea of reading. So if we just take the question, for instance, that's organizing this occasion, uh, how we read in 2023, I imagine that both of us would want to ask, well, who is hailed or who is included in that we? Uh, because when we look at global literacy rates, for instance, they're at 87%, 99% in developed countries, but still low in many parts of the world. So one of the preliminary questions that we might want to ask is, who reads? Who has access to the means of literacy? Who has access to the means of writing? What are the institutions in which they learn how to read? And how do those institutions look different from country to country? This is why I think Azar's Reading Lolita in Tehran is such a wonderful book, because I think it's making what is essentially a kind of sociological argument about how we interrogate the particularity of reading, but it's doing it in this intensely human and very deeply felt way. So it's not just that we think about reading as something active, it's that we think of reading as being a very various activity that changes and takes on an entirely different meaning, an entirely different political resonance, an entirely different emotional structure, class structure, whatever, based on where it's being done and who is doing it, what they are reading and how they are reading. And I think we can bring that same kind of you know, specificity to bear just on the very title of this, of this event. Well, um... You said it, <laughs> Mer. I mean, uh, uh, that what, what you're talking about, um, the variety of readers and the, also, of course, the limitations that are imposed upon uh, some. Uh, I, I was reminded of um, this um, uh, quotation by Nabokov, who, was, um, who mentioned that readers are born free and they ought to remain free. Uh, so I feel that um, readers have something at stake here about what to read and what not to read. Um, they ought to uh, be active. It, it is not just about um, defending the rights of the writers to free speech. It is also about the right of the readers to read whatever they want to and however they want to read it. So um, I, I think that that is an important question, especially today, uh, as much in the United States as anywhere else uh, in the world that we have to address. Uh, and I think what's so wonderful about your book, Azar, is, I mean, part of the question it seems to be asking is, what does it mean to bring literacy and a very particular kind of literacy, a literacy that is premised on ideas about freedom, ideas about self-expression into a political regime where those are not valued? Uh, what does it mean to teach in that kind of setting? What does it mean to teach particular novels in that setting? And I think it's so important that we put yeah, that we put the pressure of the specific or the particular when we ask these questions, because it's so easy to project one's own reading situation onto uh, or to treat it as if it were the same for everybody, when in fact it, it absolutely is not. And I think your book shows that very brilliantly. Yes, uh, I agree with you completely on, on, on this. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I love the way you complicate things. Uh, so uh, the, the, I uh, had sometimes when I think about my experiences about uh, teaching uh, uh, in Iran, I feel that they sound so exaggerated. Uh, to uh, especially people who have not lived under those conditions. But I was thinking of uh, one episode that I keep talking about, and that is um, a student of mine. Uh, at the, the very first year I was teaching in Iran, I had um, this student who was um, uh, a very religious girl. Uh, she came from a very uh, poor background. Her mother was a cleaning lady and her father was dead. 
And uh, this girl uh, in my class fell in love with Henry James. She uh, was so taken and impressed by uh, his Daisy Miller and Catherine Sloper of Washington Square. And after class, she would come to me and we would talk about women and their independence. And here she was in her chador, uh, you know, a very slight little girl. And um, I lost track of her uh, when I left that university. And years later, another student uh, came to uh, visit me at my the new university I was teaching. And she said that uh, she was in jail uh, with that student whom I had lost track of. And she said, we had so much fun talking about um, uh, Henry James and Fitzgerald about Great Gatsby and uh, Washington Square. And I imagined that situation in the jail where uh, 15 of them uh, had to live uh, in the same cell. And uh, they are laughing because they're remembering Scott Fitzgerald and Henry James. If that is not connecting to the other, I don't know what is, you know, and those readers change our concept of, of, of reading itself. To make a long story short, uh, that student also told me, you know, Rosier, that's the name of the girl who liked James, she was executed. And that question for me became broader because Rosier was not saved by Henry James. He could not, you know, there was nothing practical about it. Why is it? that so many people, when you think of the concentration camps, when you think of the gulags, so many people in gulags and concentration camps and in jails turn to literature, turn to music, turn to art. Um, none of them are saviors uh, to our pragmatists among them, but they remind them of the best that humankind has achieved. They remind them of their humanity in a situation where everything is dehumanized. And uh, those kind of readers are very much neglected. Uh, we don't learn lessons from them, you know. There, there's a, I think there's a wonderful, just a humanist point in what you're saying. And then there's a broader political point that I think we could bring to a place like the United States or any developing uh, developed country, uh, which is that one of the places where it seems like the humanist rationale for reading what you're saying, right, offering what the best the best that the human spirit across history has had to has created, and a sort of political rationale for widening access to reading is in the prison system, is in the system of mass incarceration. And so to me, one of the most exciting and really one of the only places where I think you can make a genuine political claim for the teaching of literature nowadays uh, is in the prison system with the rise of prison literacy initiatives. Uh, because there, the humanist rationale for reading that you're articulating goes hand in hand with a rationale for widening access, for actually bringing literacy to people who would not otherwise have the means of reading and writing. Uh, because there's only so much you can do, I think, if you're working within the kind of conventional institutions of liberal education. There's only so much you can do within, say, elite Ivy League universities or R1s or whatever. But where you can do something, where you can do something where the politics of the text meets up with the politics of the system of the institution is in something like prison literacy initiatives, or it's in expanding uh, literacy initiatives for working class. Uh, for working class people, right? So I think when we talk about how we read, part of what we have to ask is how do we bring that human spirit together with a desire to make reading something that is less unequally distributed among people? How do we make reading something that is no longer just the privilege of an elite, uh, but instead can, can, can be shared and it can be shared based on nothing other than the rationale that to lead a life without the pleasures that literary texts provide would be to lead a kind of incomplete life, uh, a half-life or a partial life. Yes, uh, 
uh, you, I'm glad you mentioned um, prisons. Uh, I have been fascinated uh, by uh, the the work around literacy in in prisons. And you know, uh, there's one thing. I mean, they're very different uh, to be in prison or to be living in a, in Soviet Union or uh, in the Islamic Republic. But one thing that they have in common is that they have been deprived of the world. Um, they are limited within uh, a, a set of rules and laws that they did not make. And it is a little bit dehumanizing, uh, this lack of connection with others. And reading uh, is the best, one of the best. Uh, it's, you know, music is another. Um, reading is one of the best ways to connect those have-nots uh, uh, to to the world, and to also uh, make it uh, democratic. Uh, I mean, uh, to be deprived of ideas and imagination uh, is a great deprivation. And uh, people who live under those circumstances know it best uh, because of the way they react. Uh, Matilda, I just want to call out Matilda in the chat who said, who pointed to Margaret Atwood's book, Hag Seed, which is very much about this. And I was just going to make two other recommendations. The one, uh, one is, I can't remember the name of the author, but the book is called Reading with Patrick, which is uh, written by a woman who goes to, uh, is, participates in TFA, Teach for America. Uh, and one of her students is incarcerated and then goes back and reads with him in prison. Um, and I found that extremely, extremely moving. And then I actually think Rachel Kushner's new book, The Mars Room, also has a prison literacy uh, angle angle to it. So yeah, thank you for that recommendation, Matilda. It's the right one. Yeah. Lovely. Um, on this same point, it's quite fascinating because as Merve, you mentioned earlier that the influence to get literacy, it's, all, it's a responsibility that pe people in this discussion, frankly, have to places like prisons. And you mentioned that the academy doesn't really have that much influence. It's not the place where reading, the, the dissemination of reading and the education of literacy is happening. So this is very broad. Where, to both of you, how can an education of that sort be instituted I guess. Yeah. I well, I actually wouldn't say the academy doesn't have influence or that that's not where it's happening. I, I think what I was trying to say was that there's only so much you can achieve politically by, say, diversifying the syllabus of a class that's being taught at a university like Harvard or Yale or Wesleyan or Oxford or where have you. There's a politics to that decision. I, but it's a limited politics and it is not, I would argue, as institutionally efficacious or as politically meaningful as actually helping people learn to read who don't know how to read, right? That seems to me to be a more, uh, to have a more direct connection to the way that society is actually organized and the kinds of inequalities that manifest themselves in the world that we live in. So that was the point that I was trying to make. But Tejas, I'm really glad you put it the way that you put it, which was, I think you're right, that we have a responsibility to figure out what the, what the politics of our discipline are, what the politics of reading are. And I think that part of that responsibility is absolutely to do things like I offer continuing education classes or offer classes at community centers um, or offer classes in prison literacy, uh, within prison literacy initiatives. I think that oftentimes the difficulty is that the administrations of very wealthy institutions would rather see their institutions open disastrous international campuses in places like Abu Dhabi or Singapore yeah. than actually go into the working class communities that are right next door to them and help people learn how to read, learn how to write, give them a certain set of cultural tools that would help them better themselves, right? So I don't think it's a problem with the literature professors or those of us who teach or those of us who write. 
I think it's often a problem with a certain set of really warped administrative structures and incentives that are much more interested in cultivating a kind of global cosmopolitan elite for reading than they are in actually making reading a source of or a, 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 a place of political contestation for equality. Does that make sense? Yes, actually, you reminded me of um, the celebrities who go to uh, Metropolitan uh, Opera. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, um, it is all about what somebody wore and uh, I seldom hear what was being played at, uh, at the opera. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, um, what you're saying uh, is also true about women, uh, that uh, there are all these great galas and uh, dinners uh, in honor of the women around the world. But uh, I have been so disappointed when talking to so many people that they know so little uh, about the places that they are uh, inviting the elite from those places to come and participate. Uh, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, I, I thought that um, these um, protests that are going on in Iran today uh, may help in educating uh, these groups about what is really happening in a place like Afghanistan or Iran. And I think what I've been amazed by just reading the coverage coming out of Iran, and you would know this better than I do, but how the protests have now moved into the classroom and how teenage girls are protesting in the classroom, right? And think about what the politics of the school or the politics of the literary looks like in a situation where you're, you put your life at stake yeah. by going to your classroom and speaking your mind, right? You know, the I think particularly in the U.S., we have a very limited understanding of what's at stake in the literary. And I think a case like Iran and the actions of the teenage girls in Iran puts it into a much, much, much wider perspective. I think that's important. Well, Iran, like um, the Soviet um, in 60s and 70s, uh, uh, these students, for them, Václav Havel, and um, Hannah Arendt and Karl Popper are, uh, are heroes. They're rock stars, quote unquote, you know. And uh, that was one thing that shocked me when I came here because when I was living in Iran, I was reading such variety of writers, uh, like the Latin American writers, or I got to know Henry Schwell, uh, uh because of, of Iran, because um, the the books were being both translated as well as uh, smuggled uh, into uh, homes of uh, Iranians, especially Iranian youth. Uh, I also um, would get really, and I'd like to share this with you, Merva. I don't know if you have come across this, but um, um, I would talk about the situation of women in Iran and somebody would, put their hand up or after the meeting would come to me and say, oh, but you're Western and it's their culture. And this came from the left and the right. You know, the right would use it to say that um, all of these people are Muslim and all Muslims are barbaric and we should not let them in. The left says, uh, all these people, um, it's their culture and we should not interfere um, and criticize them. Well, first of all, who are you to, uh, to think that to criticize us will crush us? Who are you not to treat us equally? And who are you talking about it's their culture without knowing a damn thing about my culture? You know. Uh, and, and this comes from within the academia as well as outside, you know. And now these women who are going into the streets in Iran, and as you aptly mentioned, uh, these uh, schoolgirls, they are 
fighting, if people had read about Iran, they would have known that uh, in the Middle East as a whole and in Iran specifically, uh, they have a history of struggle for uh, not just modernization, but democracy. And the women have been also part of the vanguard for over 150 years, they have fought. And Iran has some of the most progressive laws against uh, around women uh, before this revolution. I'm sorry, I, I'm not gonna, uh, but it just hurts, yeah. you know, uh, that they don't know. And uh, uh, there's this ignorance that is lodged in arrogance. And uh, uh, I can't get over it. Sorry, the hotel phone is ringing. I, I don't I'm, think the response here. How do I turn this? Shh, shh, shh. Lovely. Um, I guess if we're 30, almost 35 minutes in, would, Jeff, would you like to go to some questions from the audience? So, so let, let's do that. And, and what, a, what a rich and powerful conversation. Tejas, I'm going to ask you the first question, actually. Ready? Um, I'm just curious about generational differences and points of orientation. And uh, you and your peer group, really your peer group, because I know you, maybe some of your classmates are on this call. Forgive me for not knowing. Um, how does this conversation play with your fellow students? What resonates more or less? And are your fellow students watching with any particular attention what's happening in Iran right now? It's fascinating to hear because I originally in at school in the U.S. It's very tell us where, tell us where you were and tell us where you are. I go to school in Middlebury College in Vermont, and right now I'm studying at King's College in London. And you you can kind of tell the difference of an international community just because conversations are like the one we're having today are being taken into the public. Where at Middlebury that would happen amongst groups, amongst friend groups, conversations that happen in the public often focus on large scale issues like climate change. That's it without with a lack of specificity, which I think it's almost imperative to change now at that point. I mean, there's some benefit in that. So I think conversations like these that focus on specific issues that target head on exactly whether it's geographical, whether it's topical, exactly what's necessary is what the only thing we can go forward doing i think yeah. you're muted jeff we can't hear so thank you and uh let me uh dan Zalek, uh from stanford a, a dear colleagues with us his microphone is broken uh read his question in chat if you would right now but i'll tell you it has to do with the subversive quality of fiction and taboos, and then we'll go to Larry Haas. But Bebe uh, and Azar, are you able to see his question without me reading that important but meaty paragraph or important and meaty paragraph? I don't see it. Where, where is it? It's in the chat? It's in chat. Let, let, me, let me just go ahead and read. Okay, oh, here. Oh, oh my God, I'm so bad at this. Okay, don't worry. I'm reading. Here goes. So, is fiction more subversive? or more dangerous, that question that was posed, taboo is a violation that must be sanctioned because the powers that, that be want to remind everyone that the violation must not spread. Are fictional violations of taboo more subversive than nonfiction? Maybe this makes sense. Can you comment or improve upon it? Dan, if I didn't do justice, forgive me, but I read as best I could. You go ahead. Bye. I've just repasted it so you all can read it. It's at the bottom. Oh, right. I see it. I can I can um offer an answer. I, so I, I think first I would say that there there is a difference between subversive and dangerous, right? And I think it's probably important to draw that distinction. I think in some ways the reason the Rushdie case is so shocking to us is because even when placed in a kind of global perspective, 
it seems unusual, right? It does not seem like the norm for fictional representation. Uh, whereas there are many, many instances of uh, the breaking of taboos that take place outside of fiction that are punished in much uh, swifter and much more violent ways. So I generally tend to think that I, you know, the the same way that violence outside of fiction is more real and and more is is an actual example of violence as opposed to violence that happens in fiction. Uh, I would say something similar for the breaking of taboos. I mean, again, I think I would just I would just ask that we put a little bit more, you know, I, I would I would just say that these kinds of questions are hard to ask in any kind of general way. I so the answer would be very different in a place like Turkey, where it is possible for someone like Orhan Pamuk to be prosecuted for insulting Turkishness uh, versus in the US or in the UK, where that isn't really a kind of category of legal or political offense, even if it might be a category of moral or emotional offense to some. So maybe I would just say that again, you know, we need to ask those kinds of questions in particular contexts and our greatest understanding is gained from hearing the different contexts in which we ask and answer those questions. Yeah. Yeah, thank Can you. I jump in. Hey, just please jump in. Now, I just wanted to clarify with you, Merve, about you said Orhan Pamuk can get prosecuted for insulting Turkishness. I mean, that's obviously laws like that don't are not necessarily in place in the United States. But the idea of insulting national identity feels very precarious. So could you just say more about that? Well, I mean, in Pamuk's new novel, there is this hilarious scene where the, it, it takes place on a fictional Ottoman island called Mingaria that decides to break free from the Ottoman Empire. And there's this sort of hilarious scene where the bureaucrats that are organizing this half-hearted coup I grab a kind of banner from a pharmacy that happens to be red and wave it around. And there's blood on the floor and the blood is reflecting the red of the banner. Um, and it's it's very funny because it's about a kind of inadvertent nationalism, a nationalism that arises from, in fact, chaos and kind of bureaucratic idiocy rather than a strong sense of political purpose. Um, and in fact, maybe we could say that that's what we've seen in the U.S. recently, too, a kind of nationalism that has ar arisen from a sort of bureaucratic incompetence uh, and a love of chaos rather than from a sort of uh, fully thought out sinister uh, agenda. Um, but, you know, in, uh, in, in Turkey, any child who has any understanding of Turkish history knows that this is a wonderful sort of parody of the story that's often told about how the Turkish flag came into existence. Um, and so Pamuk was, uh, was, there were charges of insulting Turkishness brought up against him, which were then dismissed because on the surface level, this scene does not resemble the founding of the Turkish Republic and the birth of its, you know, insignia or the emblems on its flag. But of course, any reader who reads it kind of understands what the joke is, right? Gets what the allegory is. Um, so I just, I'm having trouble imagining similar charges being brought up for a novelist, for instance, in the U.S., who parodied, I don't know, Betsy Ross sewing the stars and the stripes onto a piece of bunting, right? Um, which is why I say that, you know, these, these questions about subversiveness or dangerousness always have to be pegged to particular texts, and those texts have to be placed in particular contexts, and that's the only way that you can really make any kind of argument about these very, very, very big categories, uh, because otherwise we just risk, you know, saying, offering platitudes. You know, oh. It's, um, uh, we don't have that. I mean, there is nationalism, but um, in a different way. Uh, uh, but uh, it seems as if these taboos uh, about writing and reading usually are about identity in one way or another. I mean, um, the Islamic Republic uses uh, religious identity. Uh, 
Uh, and um, in uh, US, we do have uh, many who uh, object to people writing about their identity, you know. So um, uh, that is something that um, we uh, I come across uh, in almost every day. Uh, uh, it is um, what writers, who can write what? not only who can read what, but who can write what, uh, and who can write about whom. Uh, all of these are now uh, questions uh, that arise all the time. I mean, but, the, and these are, these debates now, and maybe always, you know, since the sort of canon wars in the US of the 80s, these debates about identity have always been premised on a very, very reductive, understanding of identity. And we have had boatloads of social theory and psychoanalytic theory and what have you, putting pressure on the idea that our identities are single, that they are categorizable, that subjectivity, which is this wonderful and complicated and mysterious thing, is, is something that we would even want to peg to a social identity category. And somehow that has been swept off the table yeah. all of that all of that kind of deep and thoughtful uh theorization of identity has 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 vanished and instead we are left with this i think extremely reductive and extremely oddly proprietary yeah. of identity no that's my identity you don't get to have it because it's mine right i i find this all very i mean it's it's explicable but it's sad and it's strange, I think. Yeah, that, that is my, my sentiments uh, exactly. Um, we, I mean, uh, another term that is misused a lot is the term other. I mean, on one hand, we talk about um, the importance of others, the importance of um, giving space to the other. On the other hand, uh, we attack anything that has to do with otherness uh, in terms of identity. Uh, like um, so many films, uh, the, for filming of uh, Reading Lolita, I had that experience uh, where people were saying, oh, you have to have a Persian director. I was saying that the whole idea of acting is going under the skin of someone you're not. I mean, a bad actor is one that wants to play himself time and time again, you know, <laughs> but, um, but you risk it. You risk it when uh, uh, you're writing about someone else, uh, you make a film about someone else, uh, um, all of these uh, become taboos. Thank you. Thank you all. Shall we go to you, Larry? You have the floor. Thanks very much, Jeff. This is a wonderful session. I admire both of you and I have read reading Lolita in Tehran. I loved it. It's on my bookshelf. A uh, quick comment, quick question. The quick comment is that about 20 years ago, uh, I was the public affairs director at Yale for a couple of years. And what you have said about the outreach to of uh, elite institutions, uh, uh, throughout the world rings completely true to me in terms of who they associate with and what they try to accomplish. Now, with regard to the question, um, uh, totalitarian governments trying to restrict reading is hardly a new phenomenon. I, I'm wondering if the two of you could address whether it is easier or harder for governments to do so today uh, in the ongoing and aftermath uh, to where it is now, the communications revolution, where there are so many different ways for people to communicate, try to get around restrictions. Is it harder for totalitarian governments now, or do they use those means of exploding communication to crack down more easily and create big lies? I know that this is a very big question, but I'd love your insights. <laughs> I, I, I think the answer to both parts of your questions are yes. I mean, uh, both uh, 
the totalitarian systems uh, try to use uh, uh, social media and uh, the web uh, in order to suppress and in order to uh, threaten uh, uh, the the people as a whole and opposition in particular uh, but at least uh, from my experience uh, of iran uh, social media has been very helpful in iranian people um, uh, relaying their messages i don't know how much uh, it has helped reading right now in a country like iran has its own space i mean yeah. um, uh, people uh, that is how people connect to the outside world. It is through reading, and it is mainly the younger generation uh, that that reads. Uh, a, a large portion of the population don't. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, in terms of information exchange and in terms of being in contact, uh, social media has been helpful. What you were, your question just made me think of the 2011 Egyptian uprising when there was a really sort of utopian view of what platforms like Facebook or Twitter might make possible. I mean, I think it was called the first social media revolution, right? Um, and obviously, since then, those utopian hopes have been tempered by the extraordinary dystopian reality of how those platforms control information, uh, how they surveil uh, the men's concentration of power for information in the hands of very, very few people. And I just like to think of those two things. On the one hand, the possibility that was sparked by 2011 and the Egyptian uprising, and on the other hand, the uh, kind of sober realities uh, of uh, Silicon Valley's concentration of power and concentration of technology and information. I think those two things have to always be thought together. Yeah. I and And maybe the broader point there, right, is that it's not just totalitarian governments that control how information circulates. It's also massive and very wealthy corporations mm -hmm. that control how information circulates uh, and who it circulates to and who control what is labeled uh, news you can trust and what is labeled fake news, uh, who control what you see on your feed and what you don't see on your feed. So that question of what the controls are on reading or what the restrictions are on reading uh, isn't just a question of what states, hostile states, totalitarian states, what have you are doing. It's also a question of how probably the biggest forces in our lives, which are corporations, end up regulating our reading, uh, both what we read and how we read. Yes, and added to that, you know, the whole, um, um, the compliance of these uh, uh, big tech companies with uh, totalitarian states like in china for example um, the way they uh, or or in saudi arabia uh, allowing men to track the women you know so uh, that aspect of it uh, is really also dangerous added to everything that Mirva said uh, i think that is very important so thank you. I'm looking at the clock. We have eight, nine minutes to go. I'm looking for the raised hand function. If I miss it, colleague Michelle will tell me or just wave through the screen. Michelle, anybody out there right now I'm not seeing? No hands. Tejas, let's go back to you as we really are in the home stretch now. Um, what was on your mind that you didn't yet have a chance to ask? as we're wrapping up in the next seven minutes, eight minutes? Um, I guess I want to play devil's advocate here for a second. Just, uh, well, apt for today. The Nobel Prize winner in literature, Annie Ernaux, is quoted by saying, writing is a political act, opening our eyes for social inequality. And there's also this other group of people, both inside literature departments and outside, that tries to, I guess, remove political ideology out of art and they say art must stand for itself what is i've always wondered how to respond to that what is either of you guys' response to that 
Good. Well, I I I think both of those um, uh, positions uh, um, exaggerate a bit. Uh, you know, I mean the. It is too absolutist that either literature is a handmaiden to politics or um, literature is completely separate uh, from uh, from politics. Um, uh, I uh, disagree with both of them. Uh, I think that a great uh, novel, for example, uh, is by nature, it's by structure subversive. Uh, it is the democratic structure of it that makes it uh, subversive. And so um, it, it is not that as a writer, you sit down and say, well, today, what political agenda I have. Uh, but uh, as a writer, you sit and uh, want to be, uh, as uh, we talked before, uh, witness to truth. And um, you create, you, you know, Jane Austen uh, is one of the most conservative uh, writers, uh, and yet uh, she is also so radical. I mean, at the, you look at the 18th and 19th century novel and you look at Jane Austen, and, and all of these novels at the center of them have a woman who says no to the dictates of its society and its parents. Elizabeth Bennet in Pride and Prejudice risks getting, um, um, uh, living in poverty for the rest of her life by saying no to two eligible suitors. Uh, so that freedom of choice is still rings with us. That is what I mean that uh, Jane Austen was not sitting there thinking, should I be a witness? Should I um, uh, write uh, my novels for their own sake? But it is a great novel because it is a democratic uh, uh, novel. Uh, so uh, I, I find it difficult uh, to make that dichotomy. I, I thought that was a strange thing to say about Annie Erno. I mean, she does have a novel about abortion, but most of her best novels are about having really hot extramarital sex. So I'm not sure if that is a political act. I don't think it's a political act, but like that's what one would go to Annie Erno to read about, not necessarily a kind of uh, fully formed political um, agenda. I mean, but the, the the larger answer to your question, and here I will maybe just cite a book that I am in, I'm a big admirer of. It came out in 1993. It's by a scholar who, until last year, was at NYU named John Guillory, and the title of the book is Cultural Capital. Um, it's enjoying its 30th year anniversary next year, and I'm writing the introduction for it. So it's been greatly on my mind. And in that book, I think John makes a very important argument, which is that often a lot of these debates about what we ought to read or the politics of what we ought to read presuppose or proceed as if one could simply extract ideology from a novel. So, you know, as if, as if ideology were something that were rooted in the identity of the author, the identity of the characters, what the characters did, where the novel was set, what have you. And the argument that he makes in that book is that, in fact, you know, one must always look at where novels or any other kind of fiction is taught. One must always look at how novels or any other kind of literature is produced at how it circulates, the, the particular nexus that it occupies in a whole field of forces of production and of reception. And so it is very silly to believe I, that anything can stand on its own, that any artwork can occupy some space of pure autonomy because all artworks today are commodities. They're all produced by institutions. They circulate within institutions. Um, and at the same time, that doesn't stop them from being great. Uh, but it means that we can't just kind of extract ideology from them on the basis of identity. Uh, and again, I would simply just maybe reassert what I've been saying over and over and over again, which is that all of these debates, particularly the way they play out in the mass media, the way they play out on social media, they are all the most reductive possible version of the kinds of conversations we could be having 
about representation, uh, equality, and literature? Yeah. Well, with that, and you all, that's the way 57 brilliant minutes go. And uh, let me wrap this up with the following, if I may. First of all, very inelegant. I make an advertisement. If I don't do it, my team will denounce and reprimand me afterwards, and rightfully so. American <laughs> Purpose is a relatively new publication policy forum. It is, we are devoted to the defense of liberalism and liberal democracy, reform and adaptation, absolutely authoritarian alternatives. No, not ever. We're a membership organization. Michelle will put something in chat. Please encourage family and friends and so forth to join us as a member. I did it. Sorry, inelegant. I did it. I want to thank Tetos for uh, organizing us today and beautiful moderating. Also, our arts and culture editor, Sid Lipson, who helped arrange today's program. Really well done. And then to our two guests of honor, we started by talking about what independent thought means as a threat, as a challenge to authoritarians, totalitarians, bent on control. But, but I, I'd venture to say, probably stating the obvious, that for the rest of us, it's such inspiration and aspiration and nourishment. And in the form of a conversation, you can't do better than what we have today. Inspiration, aspiration, and nourishment. Merve and Azar, wow, what a, what a wonderful conversation and conversation partners you were. So warmest thanks and Godspeed. Thank you so much. And for everybody who made time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. For having Thank us. Thanks, everyone.